Major breaking news out of the state of Illinois, a case involving the Firearms Policy Coalition has, guess what, been successful, involving a law in Illinois banning the carrying of firearms in public transportation means such as buses and subways and the like. Let's break down what this all means when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Israel Disarmed, What the 10-7 Attacks on Israel Teach Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. All right, folks, so this is a case we've covered before, Schoenthal versus Rao. This is a case that was brought by, among others, um, the Firearms Policy Coalition. And specifically, the argument was that an Illinois law that banned the carrying of handguns on public transportation, such as buses and trains and the like. The law suit claimed that this violated the Second Amendment. And Judge Ian Johnson, federal district court judge out there in the Northern District of Illinois, which is in Chicago, found that indeed this law by Illinois violated the Second Amendment, especially as applied, or certainly as applied, to those individuals who have concealed carry permits, who've already been vetted by the government and are able to carry. Now, the reason why you may have heard of this case is I covered this a week or so ago, so in Schoenthal versus Rao, because you may recall that after Judge Johnston issued this ruling in favor of the Second Amendment, he received a motion by the government defendants. And the motion by the government defendants made the case that because his ruling was so dangerous to the public, and he, they argued basically they had a great chance to win on appeal. They argued that Judge Johnston should stay, meaning pause his decision pending the outcome of the appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit here in Chicago as well. Now, the reason why you may have remembered this is because after the government filed their motion and there was back and forth between the parties, there was a special order that came out by the judge that asked and ordered, in fact, a telephonic hearing to take place today. October 2nd, 2024, to address the foundation, the basis, if you will, of a statement made in the defendant's brief that essentially said, quote, moreover, the potential safety implications of the court's order are highlighted by a recent mass shooting on the CTA's blue line in which four people were murdered with firearms three days after the court's order was entered. Now that statement in the defendant's brief, the government's brief, obviously irritated the judge because it was implying that it was the judge's order to uphold the Second Amendment that was somehow responsible for the murder of four individuals. So the judge came out with an order and said, I want you to explain to me, lawyers for the government, the factual basis for you saying what you said, connecting the dots between these plaintiffs and my order, and concealed carry holders, and your statement. Rather than, of course, while well, they really did, as we understood, you know, this typical anti-gun effort, as I see it, they just basically throw a bunch of stories up about people misusing firearms. But we all understand that people can misuse anything, including firearms. But what does that have to do with a person that's a law-abiding concealed carrier who's already been vetted by the government with no criminal record at all? Why is a murder by a criminal who likely is not allowed to have the gun in the first place, did not have a concealed carry permit, all sorts of other things, why does that somehow speak to whether or not these particular plaintiffs in this particular case of Schoenthal versus Rao should somehow be deprived of their right to keep and bear arms? Because as the United States Supreme Court has said over and over and over again, we, don't not, we do not measure or evaluate or set forth the scope of constitutional rights based upon how someone misbehaves or how criminals act. In other words, I don't lose my fundamental constitutional rights because of some behavior of some psycho nut job in Tennessee that has nothing to do with me. And why should that be the case? So after, uh, uh, so anyway, there was a hearing today, and this is reported on X by the Firearms Posse Coalition. Uh, this is what they wrote on X, quote, 
The judge in the FPC supported lawsuit challenging Illinois' public transportation carry ban is not happy with the defendants pointing to a shooting on public transportation as a reason the court's ruling should be stayed. And then FPC goes on on X to say the following after today's hearing, and this is good news, this is what they say, quote, after a hearing that started by the judge saying he had read the motion to stay as saying, quote, within quotes, judge your order killed four people, close quote, and that the defendants gave a non-apology apology, the judge has denied the motion for a stay, meaning that the decision which applies to the plaintiffs remains in effect, close quote. So this is very good news because it means two things. Uh, it means, number one, that Judge Johnston is standing by his decision that this ban on guns in public transportation in Illinois is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment, so that's good. He's also refusing to stay, which means to put on pause or on ice, his order pending the outcome of the appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, which will likely take over a year. It takes a long time, these appeals usually, so that's good. It will go into effect, presumably, unless the Seventh Circuit steps into this and enjoy and enjoy and stays uh, Judge Johnston's decision, but Judge Johnston's not going to do. The second thing, according to the FPC uh, X post, is that the judge did refuse or ref decided not to um, punish, if you will, sanction the lawyers for making that statement, implying that um, he should not, uh, that they should not have implied that he had done something wrong and caused these murders, and that is correct. And I think this is a positive precedent for the Second Amendment, even though these particular lawyers were not sanctioned. He clearly indicated after this long hearing that he expects a higher standard of proof and argument. And this makes a lot of sense. Because if I sue you, for example, breach a contract, I don't just throw up a bunch of you know, cases that say someone breached the contract. I have to tie it into you somehow, right? I have to connect the dots. And what a lot of these uh, government lawyers seem to be doing is they just basically list a bunch of nut job psychopathic criminals, terrorists, and the like, they go out there and misuse firearms. But so what? What does that have to do with you and I exercising our right to keep and bear arms? That's like saying we can't have baseball games anymore. We're going to do something in Major League Baseball because somebody might use a baseball bat. It's stupid. Crazy. Or saying that you can't use some sort of recording device. Back in the day, it would have been a VCR or a Betamax. CD player, right? Now it's the internet. The point is you can't use a recording device. Why? Because somebody might misuse that recording device to copy copyrighted material, which is a federal felony, or some other illegal, uh, you know, or some other illegal uh, thing that they do with that technology. But we don't prevent people from being able to watch movies and enjoy these recording devices because somebody might misuse them. That's just simply plain stupid. Right? We punish the people that misbehave. We don't punish the innocent. And I'm glad to see that Judge Johnston here you know, raised this issue and basically said to these lawyers, look, you got to do better. If you want to cite to issues involving gun violence, which is a, doesn't exist, right? It's violent, criminal violence with guns, then you got to tie it in to the particular case. Meaning this was a concealed carry holder with a valid permit that went out and did this. Okay, because they won't do that because they can't do that, right? The reality is most of these murders are committed by people that are not allowed to have guns in the first place as prohibited people. Most pre murderers, it's not their first rodeo. They have a long rap sheet of very bad violent crimes before they get to murder. But anyway, it's good to see that Judge Johnson did the two things. He maintained his order that says this violates the Second Amendment. He's not going to stay the decision. It's going to go into effect at some point soon. If it has not already... And he basically set a precedent without sanctioning these government lawyers that you better be more focused and do your due diligence and don't just throw a bunch of nonsense up about people misusing guns. He basically indicated that that might, I guess, you know, that might work in some contexts where you can be sloppy poppy, but it's not going to work in a court of law where you're dealing with fundamental constitutional rights. So if you want to use that rhetoric, um, you know, in a high school debate, where it doesn't really matter in a grand scheme, so be it. But you cannot do it in a court of law where rights and remedies are being thought out and fought about with licensed professionals doing their job. So good for Judge Johnston, uh, positive news for the FPC, and good news for Illinois gun owners. And we will keep you informed as this case moves forward. I presume the next step will be the government will take an appeal and seek a stay from the Seventh Circuit, and we'll let you know what happens at that point. But in the meantime, make sure you subscribe here and don't forget to follow me on x at four boxes diner and we'll see you again real soon at the four boxes diner
Orders up. Table 2A.